Hello, I'm Kate Milliken and welcome to MS Learn Online. The John Distel Prize is given every year jointly by the National MS Society and the American Academy of Neurology. It's funded through the Society's John Distel Multiple Sclerosis Research Fund, which was created by Oscar Distel and his late wife, Marion. Oscar Distel was a Society Honorary Life Member of the National MS Society Board of Directors. He and his wife established this fund in 1994 in honor of their son, John J. Distel, an attorney whose promising career was cut short by a progressive disability from MS. I'm honored to be sitting with the winner of the 2011 Distel Prize for MS Research, Dr. Brian Weinshanker. Dr. Weinshanker is a professor of neurology at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. He is also a consultant in neurology in the Department of Medical Genetics at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Welcome, Dr. Wanchaker. Thank you for being here. Good morning. So you had a study that was conducted with MS patients who had no treatment, and I'm curious about what the results were from that study. Uh, yes, this was uh, work that uh, I started in the 1980s under the supervision of Dr. George Ebers, who initiated this project. And we were interested mainly in the long-term outcomes of MS, and, and we wanted to include all MS patients. And, uh, we had the great fortune of the fact that uh, Dr. Walter Hayter came to Middlesex County in Ontario and uh, in an epidemiologic study found all MS patients. So we were able to track virtually all the MS patients in that geographic area. And um, one of our key conclusions uh, was that MS could be quite a benign illness for some patients and not, and not produce disability. We found that about half of uh, patients required a cane in order to walk after 15 years. And that became the summary statement of um, how MS patients did overall. But we found substantial variation. And we were interested in identifying factors that would predict which patients would have more severe and um, and milder MS, and we did find a number of associations, particularly in the early course of disease. For example, women overall had a um, milder course than, than men. Uh, patients who had optic neuritis or sensory symptoms as their uh, first symptom did better than patients that had weakness or incoordination as their first symptoms. But um, we found that although individually these were associated, um, um, it really wasn't that predictive for a given individual. It was hard to predict how a given individual would, would do. Uh, what we found was most predictive is how well they did after five and especially after 10 years. Um, patients who had a fairly mild course in the first five years, that tended to predict how they would do in the future. And our subsequent studies um, were, were more focused on changes over short periods of time because these were particularly applicable to clinical trials that are done over two to three years. So that, that uh, summarizes that work. Dr. Wanchicker, you have moved on from this study, but the results and what you found here actually continue to have an impact in the world of MS. Can you tell us how? Well, there have been many people that have continued to study the course of MS, and to some extent there is controversy. In fact, some contemporary studies are even finding that the course of MS is milder than what we had described. Um, it's a complicated world now with uh, treatments. Finding completely untreated groups of patients is, uh, is very difficult, but uh, certainly there's been interest. And the other major implication of our work has been to clinical trials. For example, one of the things that we found is that at certain levels of the disability scale that we use as an outcome measure in clinical trials, patients stay at that level for longer periods of time. Uh, for example, there's one point EDSS6 that's used commonly in clinical trials where patients require a cane in order to, watch, to walk. Uh, we found that patients stay at that level of disability before getting to the next point for a much longer period of time. And that's been used in clinical trials in order to decide uh, at different points in the scale uh, what do we consider true progression to the next level. And we use a half point in, pa in patients who are at EDSS6, whereas we would require a full point earlier on. So that's an implication of, uh, that's a, an example of how these results have influenced uh, contemporary clinical trials. 
you have also been involved and actually revolutionized the whole process of plasmapheresis, which is a treatment that's helping MS patients who have severe attacks. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, plasmapheresis was uh, first pioneered for MS by Dr. Peter Dow at Northwestern University in Chicago. Um, but um, it wasn't really clear which group of patients benefit, and many patients who were treated didn't seem to benefit. Um, I was particularly motivated by a study conducted at Mayo Clinic by one of my colleagues, Dr. Moses Rodriguez, who found six uh, successive patients that he had treated with very severe attacks of MS that had failed standard treatment with corticosteroids, and he reported all of them got excellent improvement, usually quite rapidly, within days or weeks. Um, so we designed a definitive, um, randomized, sham-controlled, so it was basically like placebo treatment that we included in this study uh, of 22 patients with exactly that circumstance, a severe attack of MS where corticosteroids failed. And we found that of the 22 patients enrolled in that study, 9 out of 22 um, experienced dramatic recovery and of those nine patients eight out of nine were receiving the active treatment and not sham during the time that they improved and basically about 50 percent of patients 45 to 50 percent of patients who get plasma exchange if they have a severe attack with severe neurologic deficit and don't respond to corticosteroids even after a period of three weeks because we waited that long to start plasma exchange treatment because we wanted to be sure we were dealing with patients that weren't going to spontaneously recover. About half of those patients got a dramatic uh, improvement in their neurologic deficit as a result of plasma exchange. And this has been confirmed by a number of studies that have been done subsequently, especially in Europe. Um, they weren't uh, randomized studies as ours were, but some were prospective, some retrospective. They confirmed about the same percentage improvement. I'm curious whether or not plasmapheresis, whether that someday f may be for someone like me or other patients, something that they, they will know exists that ends up being in the norm. Or is it moving forward to be to that effect? Well, we, we only advocate plasma exchange in patients who have severe attacks of disease. We've uh, had no experience, uh, really, uh, or I've had no personal experience with using it as a maintenance treatment. But I, I think that area is unexplored, and in particular for um, this type of MS-like illness, neuromyelitis optica, that we deal with where it seems that there's a very strong correlation between disease activity and the level of an antibody that we can detect that reacts with the brain. If we could use plasma exchange on a regular basis uh, to lower uh, the level of the antibody, potentially we could prevent attacks instead of um, as we do now use it after an attack has occurred to try to salvage disability. So I think um, the treatment does have potential. It, it is a cumbersome treatment. It involves having a catheter uh, for, for access. Um, of course, sometimes we can just use it through the arm veins without putting in a central catheter. But it is a cumbersome treatment, so I think that's perhaps going to limit its uh, long-term applicability, but I think there are um, certain techniques that are now being used to get easier access to uh, the circulation and, and might make plasmapheresis a feasible way of long-term treatment. So there is a disorder known as de Vick syndrome, which some people have mixed up with MS, and you have worked hard um, in your studies to make a criteria to tell the difference. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, uh, de Vick's disease had been described at the turn of the 20th century, so it, it had been known, but it, it had been thought to be an, an extremely rare disease where patients had bilateral optic neuritis and myelitis almost uh, simultaneously. Optic neuritis and myelitis can be symptoms of multiple sclerosis. Um, but we felt that the criteria that uh, were around, and there really hadn't been any formal criteria proposed, were, were arbitrary and we were seeing patients with severe attacks of optic neuritis and myelitis. On their MRIs they didn't have brain lesions, they had very long spinal cord lesions on the MRI and we thought that this wasn't just part of the continuum of MS but really was a discrete disease and I, I think we, we were, uh, or neurologists at the time were stuck with this um, concept that any relapsing demyelinating disease had to be called MS and we said gee this seems quite different and had a lot of characteristics like 
uh, neuromyelitis optica, but I think what's been particularly critical has been an observation made in collaboration with Dr. Vanda Lennon, an immunologist at Mayo Clinic. Uh, we've discovered a specific autoantibody, the first blood test for a demyelinating disease, and this antibody, which we now know is reactive to aquaporin-4, is entirely specific for neuromyelitis optica, um, pretty much 100% uh, specific. So this has added greatly. It's not a perfectly sensitive test. Not all patients are positive, but the majority are positive. And this has added uh, considerably in our ability to distinguish these patients who don't respond to the same treatments as do MS patients. They need different treatments, and their course tends to be much more severe than typical MS. Some would call it MS's evil twin. In your work, you've also worked with genes and understanding genes that make people susceptible to MS. Um, tell us what you've learned there. There had been considerable background work uh, to show that uh, genes contribute to the causation of MS. We'd done a, a number of candidate gene studies. Perhaps the most interesting one was uh, one we did of a gene called interferon gamma. We know that MS patients overproduce interferon gamma, and uh, there's pretty good evidence that it's involved in the pathogenesis of MS. For example, there was a clinical trial that was done of interferon gamma in MS, and it was found that the interferon gamma markedly worsened MS. But what we found, uh, studying the uh, genetic code or uh, genetic sequence of the interferon gamma gene, is that there were certain variants. Um, these aren't rare variants, uh, but they were more common um, or they differed in, in frequency between MS patients and controls, but only in men and not in women. And we subsequently showed that these variants that were more common in women than they were in men are ones that are associated with the level of expression or the level of production of interferon gamma. And um, th this really does fit with a body of literature that uh, has shown that women, or in the case of mice, uh, female animals, tend to produce higher levels than they do in, in uh, male animals or in men. And perhaps this doesn't matter in general, but if you have a disease like multiple sclerosis or a variety of other infectious or inflammatory conditions where interferon gamma uh, plays an important role, then this may have an influence on the, on potentially on the course of MS or the susceptibility to MS. So um, this is, I would say, still something that needs a lot more work uh, to be done, but um, uh, it's something that I've been working on in co collaboration with Dr. Orhan Kentarchi, who's continuing studies on this topic. Thank you, Dr. Wanchekar, for being here. Thank you. If you'd like to get more information on MS research, go to nationalmssociety.org. This is Kate Milliken for MS Learn Online. Thank you for joining us.